they're independent. They would be declared in the name of the Lamb. Yeah. Which one, Dave? The shot looks yeah. great. It's well, I think it, w- it was it good at the end. Was it better? I Did you it notice it? It, it I changed I a couple of times. Okay. Even at the end, like the last, there were a lot of those. Yeah. Mm-hmm. and talk to Sarah. That's And it just doesn't really, doesn't really, Do you want to do something for me? Do you want to go up on the stage and just go for it? Yeah, we've got like a robotic hand up there. Here we go. Does it find it or does it need to be led around? Come on back in. But if we find it, we'll let you, you'll be the first to know. Joe Palmer.
show. <laughs> I don't know about that show. <laughs> but I'm just kidding. Let's go try to try that. He's got bigger ears than I do. Bigger ears. ears. (laughs) Come on back in, guys. It's time. Test, test, test. Test, test, okay. How about that wrist thing? The wrist thing or whatever? Okay. Okay, everybody, welcome back. So we're starting a little bit earlier on the second half, which is great because I want to leave time for Q&A. So uh, Joe hopefully will finish, I'm hoping, 11.30 to 11.45. Give us 15 minutes plus for Q&A. Lunch is at noon right next door. (coughs) Just go outside here in the next big ballroom area. Lunch is provided there, okay? Uh, Joe Palmer again, South Carolina, blah, blah, blah. Dennis, treasurer, all that good stuff. Joe is going to continue on with Mercury. Um, and hey, Joe, can you finish like 15, 20 minutes early? And I'll we can finish earlier than that, probably. Okay, so we'll do Q and A as soon as he finishes. No, do it. But I we'll be care. done definitely by noon for lunch. Who is it? All right, Joe Palmer. Uh, I'll probably get some of my thermal slides on. All right, where's the other thing? This? Jacket pocket? All right. All right, so I can't, I can't see a thing up here, but now I can walk around, which is good, because of that blinding spotlight. So a little about me, I want to tell you. And... So I started dental practice in 1984 and quit doing amalgams in 1997. So the first 13 years of my practice, I was just like every other dentist out there. Put in mercury, took mercury out, no protection at all. Um, so I, that, was, that was my Superman period. And my Superman period actually lasted a little bit longer than that because it took me a while to find the IOMT and start learning how to protect myself. So what mercury caused in me and my family during that time, we, I finished dental school six months early. My wife was a school teacher. She broke her contract. We moved and started a practice, built a building, finished it before I even passed my state board. So this, I was young, crazy, and stupid back then. Now I'm just old, crazy, and sometimes stupid. So. <laughs> So, so my wife came to work for me. We started our practice. She sat, she did chair side, and I promise you, we didn't have a lot of patients. First year in dentistry, my profit was twenty thousand dollars for a year of dentistry in '84. So what what we got out of that was she had a miscarriage. Didn't have any clue it could have been related to mercury. Looking back on it now, I'm sure it was. A couple of years later, she quit working for me in the office, stayed at home. We did have some more kids, so she was a living home mom. 
she started having symptoms uh, which they labeled as fibromyalgia, an autoimmune disorder, whatever it is. I was pretty stupid, but I knew that was just a label. And luckily, I was working with a physician for TMJ pain. He was doing some injection, ligament injections. I had no idea he even did this. And I said, you need to go to Dr. Dr. Schwartz and just let him look at you because he treats fibromyalgia. And he diagnosed her with heavy metal poisoning. Cleaned her up. All those symptoms went away. She's been fine. So here's me, stupid ass. I'm still doing nothing to protect myself, have no clue that I may have mercury poisoning until she comes up to me and says, you got to go get checked. You're changing. My personality was changing. My, I had a really short temper. Every joint in my body ached. I was the first one in the state of South Carolina to won because during the day, giving injections with my thumb, I couldn't move my thumb. I thought I was going to have to quit ministry. So I go to Dr. Schwartz. He looked at me and said, Joe, I've never seen anybody with as high levels of mercury as you have. So that, that was my road to change. So mercury had done its damage and did its damage to me. I had a heart attack in, when I was 48. I had another stent placed when I was 58. I'm 63 now. I met my cardiologist this last week, and he said, your heart's great, you're doing great, but I bet we have to do another stent sooner or later. Let me know if you have any symptoms coming on. That's what mercury can do to you. So why I do this? Because I see all these young faces out there. I see all these females out there who can have children. I want you to be protected. I want you to practice dentistry, but I want you to be protected. I don't want you to have to go through the stuff I've been through. So I've become a biological dentist. And I don't know really where that term came from, but I think it came from our patients. I didn't make it up. Through the years of change, I heard mercury-free. Well, mercury-free dentists, well, they don't place mercury, but that doesn't mean they're mercury-safe. Do they protect their patients, and are you protecting you and your staff? So this biological thing came free, came up, just started showing up. And I really think it did come from our patients. You know, you see it on the internet. So my, what I think of as a biological dentist is one that does everything he can not use any metals in the mouth. You take precautions, you protect yourself, you protect your team, you protect your patients when you remove any metals from the mouth. And that includes titanium implants. I'm not going to get going on titanium implants. But I've been doing zirconia implants for over 10 years, and they are beautiful implants. They work great. So I would urge you to try to find somebody, if you're not doing implants, that's doing zirconia implants that you can refer to. So really, there are no dentists that are mercury-free um, because you always are dealing with mercury in dental practice. Whether you don't put it in, you have to take it out. And you got to protect yourself from the vapor. And we're going to show you Dr. Kennedy's film if it works here. Dave, I don't see it. Hmm? Your screen? I researched all the literature on the occupational exposure of dentists to, to amalgam and ended up writing a paper as a result of that research that was published on exposure predominantly to particulate matter. As dentists drill out a filling, their dental drill runs at about 400,000 RPM and it sends a shower of micron size and submicron size particles everywhere. It's tens of thousands of parts per million. There was literature actually that measured the amount of particulate matter 
um, in the airspace or the, the breathing zone of a dentist during removals. And a researcher had studied this using mannequins into which they had put in fake teeth with fillings in them and then drilled them out and taken all the measurements while they were doing it. And the dose of particulate matter experienced by dentists if they don't take precautions is huge. It's way larger than the vapor exposure they get during the same process. Particulate exposure for a single filling delivers m micrograms of mercury, which in mercury terms is a lot. And um, this happens, you know, at the time, the average was around four to five fillings were removed by a typical dentist in any given day so that he could replace them or whatever. Mm -hmm. And if they, even if they wear the typical surgical mask, they're designed to stop particles of around three microns in size or larger, because that's the size of typical bacteria. Well, the particles of amalgam pass right through that mask because they're, well, less than three microns. They average around one and a half microns in size and go down to the submicron level. The, the amalgam load would probably give them 100 times more exposure to mercury than just inhaling the vapor that, that is present at the same time. The particle load carries, an, well, 50% of the mass of any particular particle is mercury. And that's delivered straight to the lungs, and it's absorbed within three days, and the mass is quite large. And it stays there, as opposed to the mercury vapor drops off fairly quickly. The amalgam particles that have been inhaled, they don't dissipate anywhere but directly into the body. So uh, the dose delivered is very, very significant. Okay, so a little bit more of my story. I went through chelation one time. And my levels were like 85 micrograms when they measured it in challenge tests on urine. And it got my level down by about half. So then after I had the first heart attack, or before that actually, um, I found this new doctor and I went to him and I checked my levels again and they were back up. And I'm going, wait a minute, I've been using some basic protocols. Most of the time I'd wear a mask. At least I had a high volume suction for myself and uh, that was about it. So it kind of made me think, well, why my levels go back up? And we're not sure why. Maybe they never came down all the way. You know, just when we tested, we didn't get it all and I had really more in there than we thought. So in discussion with uh, Matt, Dr. Young and David Wark and those guys up there, Bill Virtue, we decided let's run another study. Let's, let's try to figure out where particulate goes in the operatory when we're doing this. So we did this first study and we, we took out, we thought we did this thing just set up perfect. We had an industrial hygienist come in. We started out with all our controls, which I'll be going over in place. We take one control off, we do another session, we measure everything, exact same spot, wiping surfaces and then having that tested. We also measured vapor, we also measured vapor and particulate at our breathing zones. We had monitors right here. We were fully protected. Maddie came and says, you know, we got to wear these biological suits while we're doing this. And I looked at Maddie and said, I'm not wearing that thing all day long. You mean, seriously? Wait, you, you saw in that previous video, these guys dressed up in biohazard suits and that plume of parasol coming out as we did this. That was Maddie and, and myself in my old office. So we figured out doing all that, that even with all our controls on, there was still potential for exposure. And that's why it's so important, the things I'm going to be telling you today, so that you will be protected and be willing to wear some of this stuff that we're going to ask you to wear. So if all our controls on, particulate and vapor, which we measured at our breathing zone, we were putting out 3.3 .3 micrograms. And we saw an average of the total vapor of 160.5 micrograms. And remember, you, when you see studies, they talk about peak levels or average levels, but we were taking this stuff out. It would take like about 20 minutes a session. You're breathing everything that whole 20 minutes, the whole volume of that every 20 minutes. And I didn't bring my glasses, but that thing's little up there. Now, I don't know these numbers anyway. But look over there on the particulate samples. Look where those numbers are. And that's getting on the assistant's knee, on the patient's chest, different places that we, that we measured. 
2.2 micrograms, and look at that 340 micrograms on the patient strip. So then we looked, I, we had all sessions, but I'm not putting them all up here. We had water and dental suction only, which is the way most dentists practice. You know, they don't have the high volume suctions and other things I'm going to show you. And you can see those levels all go up to 300 and what's that, 60 for the assistant? Next time we got to use my computer. <laughs> I can't read those. Y'all can see them though, right? Pretty high, okay? Oh, jeez. So the results of that study were, with all controls in place, the dentist, assistant, and patient are still exposed to mercury vapor in particular. So you just can't, it's, you just can't not protect, fail to protect yourself. You can protect the patient. The patient's getting protected pretty well. But if you don't wear a respirator mask, you don't wear a disposable garment like I'm going to be talking to you about, all that particulate's going on in your clothes, you're breathing it into your lungs, you're contaminating yourself and your team. So, the ADA tells us, you know, just the basic things. I mean, this came out in the 1970s when they were getting away from cheesecloth and amalgam. They were putting amalgam into capsules, and they were telling us these precautions. You know, use the pre capsules. If you spill any, you got to clean it up. Well ventilated offices. You probably shouldn't have carpet. Open the windows if you can and clear everything out. But that's as far as they went. Wear a mask, but they were talking about cloth masks, which do nothing, as you heard Dr. Richardson say. So, those are recommendations that do not work to protect you from mercury. Because if they did, I wouldn't have had mercury poisoning from being a dentist, and I wouldn't have two heart attacks, probably. So, 29th year of practice, I've now been practicing 36 years, I had to go through chelation again because I wasn't doing all the protection myself that I should have been doing. I was doing what we thought was enough, but I was, for me, it wasn't enough. So what does IOM2 did after that study, which we didn't get this study published? We tried and they told us we didn't have enough samples, which was crazy because we had a book this thick of data that the industrial hygienist prepared for us. But we redid the study, or David and, and Maddie, and recollected the study. We've recently done a study where we just collected the particulate off the head of the handpiece and ran it to see what it was. We measured how much particulate, some of the vapor calculated, vapor coming off of that. We just got that a study approved for publication two days ago. So that's going to be coming out and be published. And then maybe we can go back and work in and get this other study kind of published also. So congratulations, David. Thank you, buddy. <coughs> All right. So the IMT has come up with more stringent protection than we had three years ago. And we've labeled it SMART, Safe Mercury Amalgam Removal Technique. We have a website for it. We have YouTube videos for it. Uh, 450 of our members are now SMART certified, which out of 1,000, that's pretty good. We, may, we wanted it, we have an accreditation process in the academy. Accreditation takes a little bit more, but we wanted to get you, new members, involved quickly and be able to have a certification that shows you're willing to protect yourself and your team. Now, as I go through this, there are no substitutions. There are nothing you should be leaving out. If you don't think, if you think you're bulletproof like I thought I was, and you want to leave some of this out and call yourself smart product certified, don't even bother. Because when we find out about it, 
We're going to call you and say, hey, what are you doing? Why aren't you using a rubber dam? Why are you using an isolite instead of a rubber dam? Why aren't you covering yourself up when you're not wearing anything? Patient, patients call. They know. Sometimes I'll have my respirator mask on, but I haven't pulled my hood up that I use. And patients will start going. They're all covered up, and they'll start waving their hand. going, what's wrong? What's the matter? You all right? Pull your hood up. You've got to pull your hood up. I mean, I've had that happen. I don't tell you how many times. Not many, that many, but it does happen. They know. So who, you, who needs the protection? Everybody in the room. Your patient, your team, the dentist. If some staff member is going to walk in there and take photos for you, they need a respirator mask on and they need to be covered up. Uh, and I don't have that because it's not my computer. Um, but basically it was dispersal oil, the instructions for it are on there saying you should do every bit of this when you're dealing with mercury films. So the procedures for the patients, we want to do a pre-rinse with them. You can use charcoal, a slurry of charcoal made with chlorella, or what I use is N-acetylcysteine and some vitamin C. And they can swallow that rinse. It'll get, get in, in their stomach and coat it. You want to use full body barrier protection, including head and face protection. A nasal air supply for the patient. Now this can be, I just use my nitrous unit without the nitrous. I just use oxygen off that. You can have oxygen, some of you may have it piped in your office. And you can use oxygen from that source. But you, you can use a scuba tank rigged up to a nasal air supply. It doesn't have to be oxygen, it can be room air. I mean, compressed air, but they cannot breathe the room air as you're taking this stuff out and creating an aerosol of, of vapor and particulate. We want you to use a vinyl dam and nitrile gloves and coat the dam with some Mercury X cream that traps particulate and reduces the vapor penetration through the vinyl dam. We do know that the vinyl dam and the nitrile gloves, there's less penetration of vapor than using latex. We're going to put a saliva ejector under the dam to, to not really pull out saliva, but we like to pull out any vapor that may cross that barrier. We're going to have some eye protection for the patient. All right, come on. Huh? There we go. All right. We're going to use this cleanup suction device. Um, you'll see it in the pictures in a minute. It has a little chamber that goes over the tooth you're working on. And we know from our original particulate study, the thing works. It's kind of a pain in the rear. Sometimes you have to trim it a little bit to make it work. You use a long shank burr to take out your amalgam. But it does reduce the particulate that spreads around the room. When we took that away, we saw particulate levels go up. We're going to use auxiliary suctions with mercury air filtration. We'll show you those. They're big units. Lots of water in a conventional high-speed handpiece and your conventional suction all at the same time with the uh, uh, cleanup attached to it. We like to get the mercury out in the biggest pieces as possible, try to cut it out in chunks. And then uh, when we take all that off, we're going to give the patient a post-rinse, again, with either slurry of charcoal and chlorella, chlorella or in acetylcysteine and vitamin C and you do not want them to swallow that rinse you want to suction that out so here's our patient barrier protection there's several ways to do this this is the only way this is the way uh, this is the way I do it this is Tyvek material which I buy in the big long big rolls and I buy that from material concepts and I just go, I have it hanging up in the office, and just we peel it down. It's about five feet long, and we cover the patient from neck down with that. Those are Tyvek hoods she has on there. I get those from Uline. Um, and then they got some safety glasses on. So when they're in the chair, that's what you see. Okay? Do some patients kind of freak out a little bit? You get your claustrophobic patient, that's tough on them. Most of them, 
are fine with it. I mean, we, we a lot of, most of the time we do these, we do the entire mouth at one time. So that may be on them for 20 or 30 minutes sometimes. Most of them get through it. If they can't get through it, I will bring them back, put them on a little trazzle arm, and then they can usually get, get through it and sedate them a little bit. There's a slob ejector under that vinyl dam, if you can kind of see it in that picture or not, but it's there. This is a picture of the cleanup. The cleanup device has its negative things too. The barrel part of that, where the cleanup is on the lettering there, it's not disposable. I mean, you could, but it's going to cost you a lot of money. And as you use them, they get really black inside. So we've tried to come up with a better solution, and we haven't been able to do it yet. The little end tip, the little vinyl part on the end, the flexible part, that you throw away. And you can trim that, like if you've got a tooth and rubber dam clamps in the way, you can trim it a little bit and make it fit down a little tighter. You see the nasal air source, that's just from my nitrous unit, the tooth's isolated, saliva ejectors underneath that rubber dam. And then we found this really helps. This is a HGX cream and it's full of sulfur. So it grabs the mercury particulate. It helps neutralize the mercury and keep the vapor from coming off. Then we have some engineering controls also that help keep your environment not contaminated to protect you and your team all day long. So any device that we actually use for that, we'll show you. Now one, other, one thing is in some buildings, your dental suction unit may not be vented to the outside. It could be vented back into your equipment room. And if it is, all you're doing is recirculating mercury particulate and vapor back into your office. So you've got to make sure those things are vented to the outside. We have oral aerosol evacuations unit. Now, some of these exhib exhibitors will be here. Uh, the den air vac is a very economical unit, and it works great. And he is, Mike is usually here. The IQ air has different speeds. It's not quite as loud. It has more whistles and bells, a very effective unit, but it costs a little more. And these are our high volume evacuation units that we place as close to the working field as we can get them. This is Dr. Young's office. We want to use nitrile gloves because you get less exposure through the gloves. You can use this HGX cream on your hands before you glove up and it will help protect what gets through the gloves. Smells a little funny. Some of the girls don't like it, but I find it very useful. These Mercon products are very helpful in cleaning up particulate that you've created in your operatory after the procedures are over. So what we will do is we get all the amalgam out. Then we take all the protection barriers off, get them out of the operatory, dispose of them as properly as we can. I'll go over that a little bit. Then we take these Mercon wipes and wipe some surfaces down like the head of the hand piece, or we can switch hand pieces, however you want to do it, but you still need to wipe those things down before you put them into the autoclave. Because if you put a bunch of mercury particulate into the autoclave, you heat it up under pressure and exhaust that vapor when you get done, it's going all over your office. So these are Mercon wipes. They're Ross Healthcare products. Uh, and from Canada, for you Canadian guys, uh, I think you get them from Ross. I get them here. Uh, I think I get those from Granger. They have all kind of different products. Yeah, I get them from Granger here in the States. And that's the uh, cost of them, or at least it was when I made this program up. Here's the cleanup, a little bit of picture of it. You get this from the Academy. We are the U.S. distributor of the cleanup device. It's the only place you can get it. I also have some 
whole room air filtration systems that run all the time. I've actually got two, in, two or three in the office now. Uh, you can look at E.L. Faust. He's always here. And these filtration systems just help protect and bring your levels down uh, all day long. Now for the dentist and team barriers, oh, I've got some masks back there. I can't, is anybody back there on the table? I can't see y'all. Jim, there's some masks right over here, on, or whoever's on the back row there. Y'all see those masks? Wiley, are you going to get them? Grab those. You can just, you can just pass those. Let them, let them, let's let those go around the room. Let's hand them to somebody. Now, those two masks that are coming around, they only have one filter on them simply because I couldn't find the other filters when I went to get them. But uh, y'all just take those and look at them. Okay? Because these, this is so important, and it's what you don't want to do, especially our females, because it's going to mess your hair up. And they're hot. When you're wearing them, all this stuff is hot. I, li I practice in the South. My rooms are freezing just because we have to put this stuff on. So we just give our patients a blanket and cover that blanket up and wash them for every patient. So you have the choices in these kind of masks. That's the 3M full face mask. Um, and for that one, you can use loops or, oh, I'm sorry, that's a full face mask. That's the 3M full face mask. You can get corrected lenses on those, but you can't get you can't wear loops with them. The Comfo Classic mask uh, just covers your nose and your chin, and you can wear your loops. You also have to have some head protection. Or you can do like Jack does, Jack Call. He has a positive pressure mask that he uses. So he's got that tied into an air source, which I think he's got oxygen running on it. But like I said, it could be a compressed air tank. And he's got that going to him. He's got the assistant has one on, the patient has one on. There's his positive pressure mask. Here's Dr. Warwick, our AV guy back there. He really is a dentist. And he's using a, underneath the mask he's wearing, he has a mercury vapor mask, another one. And he's got a head shield. And we have those at the booth. I didn't bring one of those in here. And he's got a hairnet on. He's got a surgical gown on. You can see his patient's covered up. Can't see the patient. Where's the patient? And then he's got his, everything he's supposed to have there. High, vo high volume evacuation is there. This is working in my office. We just, I like the Uline suits because they have booties built in, so my shoes and everything are covered up. We had a, uh, when we did the original particulate study, we kind of came in and scoped Jerome's office and tested for vapor and I used to have this big teaching room about as long as this front table here and I had a chair on one end and a big island where the doctor used to come in and, and do stuff and on the other side of that island there was a really pretty oriental rug about 10 by something 13 and my daughter wanted the rug because we were moving out of that office in like the next two weeks we were getting out of there I wouldn't have done this study if I was staying there so we, we were checking everything for because we wanted the mercury levels down. I said, guys, check, let's check that carpet. Let's see what's in there. Well, we got hits on that carpet. So we rolled that carpet up, a couple thousand dollar carpet, and threw it in the dumpster. Told my daughter she couldn't have it because I didn't want my grandkids crawling around on that carpet. And so as we were doing the study, throughout the day, at the end of this study, we did eight amalgams no water drive and we were all suited up and the numbers that were going up on all our monitoring devices were scary i wanted to stop at four matt said oh we got to do it we got to finish the study i mean there were chunks flying everywhere it was terrible so that room was kind of closed off it had doors on it we got done we went we were through for the day we walk over in the other room and take our mask off to the hygiene side of my practice, which literally was closed off from this room on the other end of the building. Like I only had four operatories at the time. And there was a drone laying in there, and I go, man, we better check, see what's, what's going on in here. It was high as it could be. 
I mean, it, it was still scary high. It was like over 100 in that room that the air conditioning system had carried over there. So I said, let's get out of here. We opened the windows up in the office, turned all our suction devices on, left them open all night long. Somebody could come in and steal everything they want. wouldn't have mattered. And uh, they probably would have killed them anyway. And so then we came back in the next morning. Everything was down to zero. You know, all those suction units were working. Everything had cleared out. But that, I get, that, will, that will wake you up, guys. If that, that story didn't wake you up, you need this protection. Okay? Even though it looks scary and it's not comfortable. Here's Dr. Young doing the same thing. What about the instruments that get contaminated during the procedure? Well, mainly, just keep your mirror out. If you need to explore, fine. Rubber dam clamps, all that stuff. We just take it out of the room as soon as we're finished. We wipe them down, get them into sterilization, spray them with Mercon down in before they go into the... Um, you know, a little vibrating thing, whatever that thing's called, and try to clean them up before we contaminate the rest of the office with them. Then we take fresh instruments and finish our restorative work. After we take everything off the patient, we let the patients rinse again with the NSL cysteine and vitamin C in my office or the chlorella charcoal rinse and slurries that you can use also. Don't let them swallow that one. So it looks like in video. I'm Dr. Griffin Cole of the International Academy of Oral Medicine and Toxicology. Patients and dentists should make sure that each step of the safe mercury amalgam removal technique or SMART will be applied during a dental appointment for filling removal. The first step is for patients to consult with their dentist before the mercury filling removal begins so that both the patient and dentist agree that all safety measures will be in place. This helps to ensure that the patient and dentist know exactly what to expect. It's also helpful to watch the following example of the safe mercury amalgam removal technique, or SMART, being applied. Each room where mercury fillings are removed should have adequate filtration in place, which requires a high volume air filtration system such as IQ Air Dental Mercury FlexVac or similar device capable of removing mercury vapor and amalgam particles generated during the removal of one or more mercury fillings. If possible, windows should be open to reduce the mercury concentration in the air. The patient should be given a slurry of charcoal, chlorella, or similar absorbent to rinse and swallow before the procedure unless the patient declines or there are other contraindications making this clinically inappropriate. Protective gowns and covers for the dentist, dental personnel, and the patient should be in place. All present in the room should be protected because substantial quantities of particles generated during the procedure will elude collection by suction devices. It has been demonstrated that these particles can be spread from the patient's mouth to the patient's knee and to the chest, shoulder, and neck of the dentist and dental assistant. Either a properly sealed respiratory grade mask rated to capture mercury or a positive pressure properly sealed mask providing air or oxygen should be worn by the dentist and all dental personnel in the room. Non-latex nitrile gloves should be utilized by the dentist and all dental personnel in the room. Face shields and hair head coverings are to be utilized by the dentist and all dental personnel in the room. In order to protect the patient's skin and clothing, a full body impermeable barrier should be utilized. External air or oxygen delivered via a nasal mask for the patient also should be utilized to assure the patient does not inhale any mercury vapor or amalgam particulate during the procedure. A nasal cannula is an acceptable alternative for this purpose as long as the patient's nose is completely covered with an impermeable barrier. A saliva ejector should be placed under the dental dam to reduce mercury exposure to the patient. A dental dam that is made with non-latex nitrile material should be placed and properly sealed in the patient's mouth, as well as a full head, face, and neck barrier that is under and around the dam. During amalgam filling removal, the dentist should utilize an IQ Air Dental Mercury FlexVac or similar device in close proximity to the operating field, that is two to four inches from the patient's mouth 
to mitigate mercury exposure. High speed evacuation produces better capture when fitted with a cleanup device, which is preferred. Copious amounts of water to reduce heat and a conventional high speed evacuation device to capture mercury discharges should be used to reduce ambient mercury levels. The amalgam should be sectioned into chunks and removed in as large of pieces as possible using a small diameter carbide drill. Once the removal process is complete, the patient's mouth should be thoroughly flushed with water and then rinsed out with a slurry of charcoal, chlorella, or similar absorbent during the opening and maintenance of suction traps in operatories or on the main suction unit, dental staff should utilize the appropriate personal protection equipment described earlier. An amalgam separator should be properly installed, utilized, and maintained to collect mercury amalgam waste so that it is not released into the effluent from the dental office. Dentists must comply with federal, state, and local regulations addressing the proper handling, cleaning, and or disposal of mercury contaminated components, clothing, equipment, surfaces of the room, and flooring in the dental office. I hope that you'll make the smart choice about your dental care by asking for safety measures during your mercury filling removal. For more information about the Safe Mercury Amalgam Removal Technique, or SMART, including scientific research about why these safety measures are important, visit thesmartchoice.com from the International Academy of Oral Medicine and Toxicology. All right, so as dentists, we collect, we create a lot of mercury waste. And we, as stewards of our environment, we should protect our environment. In South Carolina, we have mercury warnings in every lake and stream, fresh water. And it's most of that contamination is coming from dental offices. The EPA has finally mandated that we have separators, but then they keep putting it off like it was 2020 everybody had to have them. So now it's what, another year they're giving everybody? It's ridiculous. The things are not expensive. They're cost of one crown, guys. Buy one and put it in your office if you don't have it. Mercury is one of the most toxic elements and a persistent traveler through our environment. So who's the travel agent for this elemental poison? Coal-fired power plants? Most definitely. Mining operations? Of course. Your neighborhood dental office? Surprisingly, yes. The United Nations Environment Program reports that 10% of global mercury usage is for amalgam tooth fillings. This results in up to 340 tons of dental mercury journeying into the environment each year. In the United States, dentists are currently the largest users of elemental mercury. This accounts for roughly 32 tons of mercury used yearly to place amalgam restorations, otherwise known as silver fillings. Although the number of amalgams placed has decreased over the last few decades, dentists still use amalgam without precautions, so the threat of mercury exposure continues. Dental mercury travels many pathways on its journey back into the environment. It starts when a dentist receives precapsulated dental amalgam. In each capsule, up to 900 milligrams of elemental mercury is separated from the other alloys. To make the final product, the capsule is vigorously shaken in a triturator to thoroughly mix all the elements. Occupational safety concerns arise because this heats the mercury, creating thousands of micrograms of mercury vapor, which are released upon opening the capsule. The used amalgam capsule still contains a small amount of mercury, so the ADA recommends the capsules be stored in an airtight container and collected by a hazardous waste company. Unfortunately, the majority of dentists toss the capsules into the trash. This mercury-contaminated trash will eventually travel to a landfill, where the mercury will continue its trek down into the soil. Back at the dental office, 
The freshly mixed amalgam is placed into the tooth. The dentist then carves away any excess material. While patients swallow some amalgam waste, most is suctioned out and flows through a filtration system. But this system only captures a small percent of the larger pieces. The vast majority of much smaller pieces escape into the wastewater. A similar scenario plays out when dentists replace amalgam fillings. Many dentists clean out their filtration systems by dumping the captured mercury-tainted sludge down the drain. A study funded by the ADA estimated that amalgam fillings contribute up to 50% of the mercury found in wastewater. This contaminated water then flows to publicly owned water treatment plants. While efforts are made to remove the mercury from wastewater, most of it settles down into the sewage sludge, which is then taken and spread on land as fertilizer or deposited in a landfill. In both scenarios, the mercury constantly off-gasses into the atmosphere and seeps into the ground. A percentage of the sewage sludge is also sent packing to incinerators. With over 200 tons of dental mercury in the mouths of Americans, even exhaling is a contributor of mercury to our atmosphere. Additionally, people with amalgam fillings serve as hosts for mercury's passage back into our environment through the excretion of human waste. Mercury's ride continues even after death. Crematories, which are unregulated and contain no filtering processes, are a growing vehicle for transporting mercury back into the atmosphere. When all the various pathways are accounted for, dental mercury from the United States contributes roughly 28 and a half tons into the environment each year. The governments of the world are actively working together to reduce the amount of mercury released globally to protect human health. The first and foremost step to eliminating mercury released from dental amalgam is to discontinue the use of this toxic material. With the threats so great and the solutions so simple, it's time to restrict mercury's passport. You know, our organization has been working almost 30 years to try to get dentists to quit using mercury and fillings. I hope we don't have to go another 30 before it's gone, because it is decreasing, which is a good thing. But in your careers, you're still going to be taking it out. So what do we do with the waste we create in our office, like the mercury on the rubber dam, all those particles, the mercury on our gloves? So what I do, and this is really not part of the SMART protocol, I don't think, but we recycle the big, heavy, gross stuff that we can see all that particular on. I use a company called Stericycle, about a five-gallon bucket. We uh, actually, I put it into a little bucket that's got a top on it in the operatory, and then we empty that bucket at the end of the day because every time you open this bucket, you know, it's full of mercury down in there. So you should be wearing protection and preferably do it with a high volume suction going when you open up that bucket. The gowns, we really hadn't found a good solution for, I'll be honest, because, you know, those buckets cost 500 I think, maybe $800, and I'll probably fill that up every four to five months. And if you put the gowns in there, I'd fill it up every two days. So... The gowns, the heavy gowns, we do place in the trash. And our state doesn't care. So separators, we've always had a separator. You can, uh, you'll be some people here the, talking about separators. There's all kind of different kinds of separators. Uh, I like this one. This one has a scientific review that's in our literature, the IMT's literature. It gets out 99.5% of the mercury. Uh, I probably change mine about once a year. It's got some quick disconnect features, so you can change them pretty quick and pretty safely. Uh, they also make a cleanser, power lines cleanser, that does not have chlorine. If you use a chlorine-type cleanser, it actually releases more mercury in that line than cleans it out. So... This power lines cleanser is the best one to be using. <clears throat> so 
Why are we not supposed to eat humans anymore? Because they contain toxic levels of mercury, thanks to all the fillings in their teeth. Now, I'm going to have an open for questions, but I also want to talk a little bit about what it means to be a member of thy own teeth. I want you to take these really simple, I've really done this presentation down for the day. I've taken a lot of the science out because Bill was supposed to do a good job convincing y'all mercury was actually a poison. I want you to take these safe protocols you learned today and fully get them implemented into your everyday routine for every procedure that has amalgam. And how many metal-based crowns do you take off and have amalgam under there? You might as well just assume that when you're taking off some kind of metal-based crown, porcelain, whatever, it's going to have mercury under it. So for those patients, you need to have protocol. And for yourself, go ahead and just suit up and just assume it's going to be there. Um, and I don't want you to leave parts out. How many people use a rubber dam? Be honest. It's okay. You're going to have to get into that again. Okay? I know everybody used them in dental school, right? I mean, that was the only system I had in dental school was a rubber dam. But we use rubber dams for every procedure. If I have to anesthetize the tissue and clamp tissue, I will get a rubber dam on that patient if I have to take, say, mercury out of a root extraction that I've got to separate roots and there's a hunk of mercury there and there's nothing to clamp to. I will use a rubber dam. We'd love you to become a fluoride-free practice, include eliminating fluoride-containing composites. That seems like that would be a financial hit. It's really not. You'll have patients coming to you just because you don't use fluoride. You'll also make up the difference because you're going to charge extra for these protection features. We charge $190, I think, every time we have to pull out all our protection features. And it cost us $30 probably and a little extra time. Dr. Young charges $350, I think, in his office. So you can put it wherever you want it. People will want it, and they will pay for it. You are going to have some outside investment um, as far as equipment. Now, I'm the treasurer of IMT for a little while longer, and I'm trying to get us out of being out of the supply business because we really lose money selling you well, we always have to do cleanups because we're the only distributor for it and we have the license. But the mask and the other things that we sell, we don't make a dime. We actually probably lose money. But it's easy. We will make a package for you. There's a, we've got a guy who's trying to start up a business where he will supply this stuff to you in a package. And he'll be at our booth, go by our booth, decide whether you want to buy it from all of the Rangers and the Uline people and wherever the Mercon wipes and all that stuff on your own or if you'd like to make it nice and simple and just have a package he'll have a package for you and you can buy it from him so we're trying to make it as easy as we can and that's for like the disposable stuff and the gowns and the masks and those kind of things um, the the separators, they'll have, we got the boss people will be here. I highly recommend them. That's personal. That's not the IMT talking. That's me talking. The, the high volume evacuations, I use the Den Air Vax. I think we have three or four of them in the office, and he's used it here. And those are the kind of things you have to make purchase to get this going. All in all, you're probably spending the startup cost around $5,000, so not too bad. <coughs> So what's social media say? Um, what are your patients going to think when you start doing this? How are you going to transition from being whatever you were, not protecting, to all of a sudden protecting? Well, for me, it was kind of easy. Because I told my patients I'd had a problem. I've got to start protecting myself. And it makes a lot of sense to me to protect you. Do you think I ought to protect you? They go, oh, by all means. And that was all it took. The more you do this, you won't even have to have that conversation anymore. Because patients will be coming to you because you do this. They will already know about it. They will be very knowledgeable. And they will expect you to do it. And if you don't do it, 
They'll either go somewhere else or call our office and complain about you, which they do, and we'll make a nice courtesy call to you because we're not police force and say, hey, do you know you had a patient complaining because you didn't use so-and-so? You really got to use this stuff once you commit to doing it, okay? So uh, <clears throat> I think that bottom one there is a, a comment from one of my patients, the top two are from Tammy Graggio's patient who's not here today. She's in one of our past presence but you won't get bad comments from patients you will only get appreciation they will only say thank you and if you have that rare occasion that goes no I'm not doing that protection then I go well I'm not doing your dentistry I'm sorry I cannot ethically do that but I hadn't, that's only happened to me maybe twice in the 15 years I've been doing this Something like that. It was 1997 when I started protecting all my patients. So that's where we are. I hope that was pretty clear, and I hope I've left us plenty of time for uh, for questions. I think that's a slide of Italy where I'm going in May to take my wife after 40 years of marriage. We're kind of happy about that to the same person. <laughs> All right, how about questions? Yes, we've got a mic. While he's getting the mic, uh, make sure everybody goes and listens to Boyd Haley. Boyd, uh, fantastic guy, but basically he test, has test. developed a compound that all of us should be taking because it will help protect you from your exposure. Because even with all this protocol, you're going to have some exposure. And David Kenney's, if we're starting an investigational new drug study, if we get that approved, uh, hopefully we're going to make that available to everybody in here that wants to participate in the study. We also have an, an, an institutional review board that has to be for that study. We've got, I call them the first team and we need a second team. So you need about, I think, uh, we need at least 10 people. We've got six. I could use four to five more, which is going to be an easy job. If anybody's interested in that, just Come up, give me your name, get your CV together, and we'll put you on an institutional review board. Okay? Uh, right there. Okay. Um, I, do you take, like after you remove the amalgam, you take everything off, or do you restore yes. the teeth? Take it. Okay. After you remove all the mercury you're going to remove, I might be doing four quadrants. So after I get done with everything, uh, we take all those barriers off. We wipe down our surfaces with the Mercon wipes. We rinse the patient, give them one of those rinses. Don't let them swallow it. Suck it back out. And the air assistants do. Because the dentist is probably going to get out of the room by then. I, I'm the one that takes all that stuff out to the trash. Okay. Or puts it in the uh, containers proper containers where it goes. So I do that, and then while I'm doing that, after I do that, I might go check some hygiene patients or whatever. I'm really, what I'm really doing is stalling because I don't go back in that room yet. And uh, all the vacuums, all that stuff needs to be running, but what the assistants tend to do is y'all want to rip that mask off. Don't. It takes probably three to five minutes for the levels to come back down in that room, as we saw when we did our particular study. So... Don't be in a big hurry. Let it let it take a little time to clear out. If you got your windows open, it's going to take less time. Do you have something to actually measure the mercury in in your ops or? I, do, I do not. We do have a Jerome yep. mercury vapor that the academy that. has, which you could rent. 
Um, if you wanted to like test it out or see what, check your own operatory and you can keep it for a couple of weeks and then send it back to us. Matty Young has a unbelievable system in his office where he does monitor all the time. So a lot of our data can come from his system. But it's, I mean, I, to put one of those in is probably about $80,000. Yeah, and you can and you can rent one for the academy if it hadn't disappeared, or you can get a used one for about twenty five hundred. Uh, you didn't mention it, but uh, see the face on this guy, how it's fuzzy. He has to use the full face mask because the uh, masks don't work with fuzzy faces. Yeah, don't listen to him. <laughs> you saw who's on the smart video, right? He's one of those guys who can't mess his hair up. Face mask, face mask <laughs> works good. The mask that Dave Warwick and I. We use the same system as far as the, the comfortable mask. It's got a little carbon filter with the face mask and everything else that you saw. Joe chooses to wear the big Tyvek suit, so. Yeah, because Joe's had two heart attacks and then one more work here. There we go. <laughs> Actually, I'll be honest with you. This year I started working three days a week. I have two associates. My associates take all the mercury out. I very rarely expose myself any more to mercury. Hi, I imagine that you're out of network with most insurances, but uh, if you yeah. you are in network with some, no, what do you you're not no. okay. What would I you say to patients if they are if you are in network and they may be pushing back a little bit? First, I imagine get out of network is probably the best thing to do. But true, and I know it's hard to say. And I I would tell you I don't even take assignment for insurance, and really haven't for the last 25 years probably. I mean, I did when I first started practice, but. So you will find is the patients who want this, they're not going to care. Your existing patients who are in that network and have trained to be in that network, um, I mean, you're slowly going to, they may, they may leave. Okay? Excellent. Network's not going to pay for the extra, and you're not getting paid enough anyway. So, uh, you know, you need, but you need to, you can't just quit them unless, I don't know what your practice is. I'd be glad to talk to you about it, but you, you got to, you got to slowly get out of them. But. For patients, when I when I first started doing this, I went to Bill Strupp's course down in Florida in '97, and he had this was when you had slides, and literally there would be stacks of slides almost to the ceiling as long as that wall, all of them showing amalgam coming out, and all he kept calling it the black crud, the cracks in the teeth, and he just hated mercury amalgams, and so. It wasn't really about the amalgam, really, about the mercury. It was about just how crappy the amalgam is as restorative because it tears up teeth. So I came back to my office, and I told my girls, and uh, I said, all right, pack all that amalgam up. Let's get it out of the office. Anything to do with amalgam, get it out of here. I'm never placing another amalgam. And one of my little country girls who went to church, a good Christian girl, she went, well, it's about damn time. So I started changing my practice. And I had a few patients that go, well, I want amalgam because my insurance will pay for that. I said, fine, you can, you can do that, but you're not going to do it here. You'll have to go somewhere else. So I just drew a line in the sand and started doing it. Then all the stuff happened to me. And I, you know, got more knowledge. My patients actually were coming in knowing more than me when I started doing some minor protection. And they were talking about a lot of biological things, a lot of alternative medicines that I would just nod my head and go, what the hell are you talking about? I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> so my next progression, and Bill and I did this together, is we took our naturopathic course with uh, Phil, who's going to be talking to you all this afternoon. He has a biological dental school, and we took that a 15, 16-month thing, and that just changed the way I look at everything. So I had a... Uh, Tooth number nine, um, myself, had a root canal. I, had, I got hit by a car when I was a kid and finally died when I was about 30, and I uh, had a root canal. And then cone beam, this was, we did that, what, 18 years ago, I think? So cone beams were, actually came out back then. Phil had probably one of the first ones, and he took a cone beam x-ray on my root canal, which had a huge abscess on the lingual that too. My left ankle had been hurting for two years. The root canal had been there longer, but... I guess it had just gotten worse, but my left ankle had started, was hurting for two years, back ache, I think Achilles. And I played golf and I walked and I would be limping in the last three holes. 
I couldn't walk that far. And I have a high pain tolerance. I ignore pain. This I couldn't ignore. And so I told Phil, so, all right, we got to get this tooth out next time I'm back up here, and I'll get all everything ready. And so we went up there, went up there, and got there a little early. He took the tooth out. And while he was taking the tooth out, of course, I couldn't feel a thing. I said, Phil, did you just get that tooth out? He said, yeah, why? I said, my ankle just quit hurting. It hadn't hurt since. So I said, okay, God, this stuff's, this stuff must be real because it was real on me. Teeth are connected to the body. Infections, mercury doesn't just come off the top of the tooth. It goes through the tooth, through the pulp into the bloodstream. And they are all connected to the body. We're not, we're not separate physicians. We're physicians of the mouth, but what we do affects the whole body. So that made me a real believer. So as far as transitioning my practice, that was a big step in it. I got a lot more serious about doing it. I have a question. Uh, I, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about chelation and, and uh, what, what that entails and okay. how you do it. All right, as, as dentist, you should not be prescribing or diagnosing mercury toxicity. Because now you're a physician and you're an MD and the state boards will look at you and they might come after you. And that's one way, you know, Bill's had some problems with boards. I've never had a problem with the boards, but I don't do any of that stuff. I work with integrative health physicians, functional medicine doctors that do the chelation. Now what chelation is, is taking a drug, usually has a sulfur compound on it, that helps pull mercury supposedly out of the body and out of the cells, but it also pulls essential minerals out of the body. So that really the IV part is to put those minerals back in. It also makes mercury come out through the kidneys, where that's not where it's really supposed to come out. So if you pull it out too fast, you can get kidney damage. It's another reason you shouldn't be doing it. Now, I do use a product from Quicksilver Scientific, which I give my patient the option of doing as a supplement and it binds mercury in the gut and helps take it out of the gut opening up their own natural pathways so it does help help them start to detox but I don't call it that it's just supplemental protection if anything that gets them by the dam that they might swallow it will grab it in the gut and carry it out through the feces where it's supposed to go that's called uh, Mercury Protect, I think, from Quicksilver is their new name. They may have a booth here today. Yes, sir. How long did you take to get the tooth out of the body? It took two years when I was at that 45 level to get my levels under three. A lot of money. Now, Dr. Haley's product, when you'll hear him lecture, you'll understand it. It's going to, it's going to, you're not going to have to do chelation. You're just going to have to take. Take Dr. Haley's drug. Uh, in regards to um, protection and stuff from a mouth, I'm, from a hygiene standpoint, we use ultrasonics. That kind of thing. Are there any cautions or? Well, I I tell I tell my hygienist if they're polishing, don't polish the amalgam, okay. and put a mask on. Okay. I let them wear a mask. Uh, unless you're going to put that ultrasonic on the mercury. I think it's okay. Yeah, I think it's okay. I would, yeah, I would stay, try to stay away from it. When you're doing that, I put a mask on. I don't know if you're really creating that particulate. I don't think you are, but we don't have a study on that. Okay, but I would definitely have a mask on of some type. Whether it's the cloth one with the mercury things in it, maybe a face shield, or that come from a classic one, maybe. Okay. Okay, kind of. Kind of back to the chelation thing. Um, do you recommend that all of your patients go see the functional medicine doctor to be evaluated? And then do you recommend them to do chelation before or after your mercury removal? Um, good question. That's per patient. You know, if they come in and they, a lot of my patients are going to say, you know, I've got brain fog, they'll call it. I'm tired all the time. Uh, I just have no energy. Um, some of them will talk about aches and pains, kind of like I had. Some of them will talk about depression. No, I haven't really had anybody go as far as say they're suicidal. 
But if they come in with those symptoms, I say, yeah, you, I, I can make a referral for you. A lot of them are coming across the other way, already coming from that doctor, and they're already on chelation. But, which is fine, that's good, but it's kind of a waste of money if they're going through chelation and they hadn't gotten the mercury out. You know, it's just going right back in. So whether it's done first, you're, I really feel that we're protecting our patients very well. I think they are not getting exposed when we're taking their mercury out. So it, it depends a lot of times how much money they have, you know, where they gonna, where they want to put their funds first, because chelation costs a lot of money too. And when they're doing their whole mouth, they got a whole mouth of mercury, you know, it could be, it might be a $5,000 case, it could be a $15,000 case. So sometimes it's just financially hard for them to get everything done. But I, but I, and you'll have patients also that come in, right, Bill, they're kind of self-chelating and doing stuff. And I don't, I don't tell them they're doing wrong. You know, I don't, I support the patient's decisions, but I do suggest to them, might be better if you knew where your levels were. You might be wasting a bunch of money there. You might not even really need all that. So the patients will be very knowledgeable, you know, that, and you'll just have to, until you learn more about what they're doing, you just kind of just kind of agree with them. So this is a logistics question. When you first started to use a smart technique, how did you handle hygiene checks? Because you're all geared up with this oh, equipment. Well, that, I'm fast. <laughs> okay. I mean, I can take out a mouthful of mouth in the 20 minutes. Okay. So they just had to wait on me. You didn't change the suit. Yeah, I don't. I don't walk in there in that suit. That's for sure. Unless it's a contaminated suit. Now, if I haven't started yet and I have, happen to put it on, they holler at me, I might run in there in the suit. But I'm definitely not going in there if the suit's contaminated. Keep in mind, too, that once you start to market yourself as this kind of a dentist, you need to be educated because you're going to get people from all over the place, right? Yeah. Traveling from all over the country, coming to see you, and you better know what you're talking about. <clears throat> so before you get to, I'm a biologic dentist, educate yourself. This is what this is all about, but there's so much more, too. This is sort of a two-pronged question, um, but in terms of documentations, it seems like there's a lot of things that you're taking into account. I know what my composite note looks like. It seems like there's a lot more stuff that needs to be added to the note after looking at all the stuff that you looked at. And then the second part, if you do have a patient that comes in that has these issues with potential uh, uh, mercury toxicity, are you writing down levels and have you ever run into an instance where a patient said what you did didn't do what it was supposed to do? Um, I'm probably the world's worst on documenting stuff. I mean, I write down consult for mercury removal or amalgam removal. I try to leave the word mercury out of my charts. I try to just say amalgam. Now, we have form consents forms on our website that you can copy. Um, you know, they're requesting to have this done. I make it real clear when we do our treatment plans, which treatments are elective, because I mean, that's a good serviceable, no such thing, but everybody, all other dentists say that's a good serviceable amalgam. I will call that elective. Broken ones, decay, that kind of thing, they go into mandatory. They have a little mandatory by it, and I make sure it's clear that the patient requested to have those out, elected to have those out. Um, did I cover everything? Yeah, you did. Okay. <laughs> Someone's, I know, waiting over here. It is good to have informed consent. And we do have some copies on our form. Huh? Um. Yeah, written. <laughs> Sorry, so typically, if, if you're going to have a patient that's going to do this, how many of these procedures are you doing in a day, and how long of a block are you at? I know you said 20 minutes. It, it depends the on the patient. The post. If the patient's sick, they're, they're, the patient's got cancer, or they are really adrenally challenged, fatigued, really tired, and things really, anything affects them, I go slow, quarter at a time. If I've got a patient coming in, they're, they're generally pretty healthy. They're just worried about the amalgam in their mouth. They want to continue to be healthy. I'll do all of them. How long? I mean, just a block. You'll, you'll I mean, I can do. Right? You, you'll get super fast at the dam. I mean, it takes me 30 seconds to put a dam on. You know, if it's a four-hour procedure, great. 
I mean, we, we have Sarah in the office, we do that, and some of them might be composites. It just depends on the procedure. But let's say it's, uh, in my office, a, if it's a quadrant, there might be two composites in a Sarek in a quadrant. I can, we can do that in an hour and a half. If it's a full mouth and it's got like four or five Sareks, then I don't need any more patients that day. They can have the whole day if they want them. And like I said, my associates are doing them now. I'll probably do those cases some more. I want to address the gentleman, and I couldn't see you in the center of the room that was asking, uh, I think the back end of the question was, you didn't, didn't do what you said it was going to do. And is that, did I hear that correctly? Um, one thing, we don't ever guarantee anything that's going to improve you. I mean, we're not saying you're going to feel better, you're going to get rid of headaches, you're going to be, your MS is going to go. Ne we'll never, ever, ever, ever would suggest that. Um, from my angle, we're removing these mercury fillings because you're asking me to. And secondarily, these teeth have cracks in them and broken, as Joe alluded to. So, you know, we don't ever make any medical promises. You can't. You don't know what's going to happen. You don't know what's causing their problems. So that's not, that's never part of the conversation. Yeah, no, and, and no, you're removing them from the teeth. You're removing mercury from the teeth. You're removing a source of exposure to them. But you know, you're not removing mercury from the cells or the reversing the damage the mercury may have caused. And I make that real clear to them. Now, Bill said earlier in his presentation, you know, those people that spontaneously things go away, they all feel better just from getting it out of their teeth. That's all an energy response. That's part of that galvanism that was going on. You got that going away. Now the meridians of the body opened up, energy flows better. That's why that happens. So you'll see that occasionally. Check out to me. Check. But don't ever promise they're going to get well just because you get the mercury out. You, you, if you let them do the most talking, you'll be okay. <laughs> so another question. Yeah. Going there Hang too? on. You want to just come up here? Do you have guidelines as to <clears throat> what we can put on a website or advertising? Check, check one. No, no. No really. guidelines. Don't do that. No, really. We don't. Um, we've got some good people here that's, that will help you with your website. Uh, aren't you using Equa? Yes. Yeah. We use a company called Equa, E K W A. They're, they're familiar with too. biological type websites. If they're here, talk to them. Well, the nice thing about Equa too, Joe, is that they're very familiar with biological dentistry. What, we've been, what, maybe five years using them? I think. And originally, I had to rewrite Second. about everything they sent me because they do monthly, weekly updates, which keeps you, you know, high on the, uh, uh, the listing of Google and those things. But uh, it's gotten to me now where I can get a monthly change or wherever they're going to do the website. I might just change one word. But they've, they're really knowledgeable about what we're doing. They've worked hard at that. Make no health claims. You, you'd probably say you use protection. I wouldn't even use the word safe. You could, you could put that you use protection to the patient, provide protection to the patients. Get smart certified, you can use that, I think, no problem. But that, that's, I'd get them to help you. And another thing, there was a question earlier uh, in previous meetings about mercury free. Uh, it was brought up that when they were inspected that they had mercury uh, fluorescent light bulbs in their office so they weren't mercury free. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, be careful with those words. Nobody's mercury free if you're taking out mercury. No. Nah. And it varies from state to state. So, like, in North Carolina, it's real tough to don't, say anything. Don't go to North Carolina and practice. Yeah. yeah. I'm coming. A couple of questions. You mentioned that this is a stepping stone for us to learn. What's what's next? Tell us what's next. Great question. What was that? She's asking because I said uh, you know this is one of the things that they're learning is this whole fundamentals and there's more to learn. So she asked what's next. So a couple things. One is um, learn the smart process for sure and get smart certified so that you can at least say I know the process. I bought all the equipment so I can at least do that right. So you can make that claim. I'm going to safely remove your fillings. Um, you're going to learn more from Dave Kennedy on fluoride today. You're going to learn about biologics in the afternoon. You're going to learn a ton more about that. So you're going to feel a little more comfortable. But then I would suggest either the NMD program or there's other things to go further with this. 
So NMD, so it's, okay. So we've all three have done that. A lot of people in this room uh, in the academy have done it. It's a, a 18 month program. It's six weekends over 18 months and you learn a little bit about a lot of things. And so, but all I meant by that was that, you know, I'm a mentor. There's, there's a lot of us that are mentors. And I remember I had a young brand new dentist who called me and said, hey, uh, I'm so excited about this. I've already changed my answering service and all this stuff. And I'm like, whoa, whoa. What? And the answering service was like, you've reached the mercury free office of whatever. And I'm like, what are you doing? <clears throat> don't, don't, listen, we're all dentists, right? Or at least most in the room are. You're doing dentistry, okay? So don't make a big deal about it, okay? You're taking out old fill-ins, like he said, that are broken or, you know, need to be replaced. That's dentistry. You just are choosing to be better at protection. So there's nothing wrong with that. It's all, who's not gonna want that? It's when you get into the whole conversations about, am I getting sick from this? That's where you gotta be careful. Take, take advantage of our mentor program, too. Yeah. You can all, if you're a new member, you can, we'll all be assigned a mentor. All be a mentor, yeah. And what happens a lot of times is, even when I have, when I, I will call that person, welcome them, I never hear from them again. Yeah. Give them way. my phone numbers, give them my cell number, they don't call me. You get a second question, right? The ones that call me do pretty good. So speaking of mentors, who's the best person that you guys know that's working directly with a functional medicine person that's going to help me with my protocols? Well, I'll be glad to. In Houston? <laughs> We're in Texas. So we got all I'll the be guys. glad to. We have everything. Are you in Texas? Yeah, she's Houston. She's that I mean, guy right there. Yeah, I mean, Stuart I'm, Nunley. I'm in Austin. We got Stuart in Marble Falls, Matt Carpenter in Austin. We have yeah, we plenty of people. Yeah, we somebody close to you. Funny. And, and Texas, we're, we're blessed, at least in Austin, for sure. We're loaded with functional medicine doctors, yeah. naturopaths. And, and you'll see tomorrow when the meeting starts with our tags, if you're a mentor, there'll be a tag that says mentor, yeah. and yeah. just go up to any person, and if they're in the group, they'll, they'll be happy to help go you. Up, go up to any person in this academy. This is the friendliest group of dentists. They are sharing. They've helped me. I wouldn't be here if it wasn't this academy. I wouldn't still be practicing. Questions? We still got time. This is good. Okay. Yeah, just a question about maybe during the, the studies that were done, is there a difference in mercury exposure between a patient who's had amalgam fillings for five years versus someone who's had them for 40 years? Yeah, that was a smart ass answer. I, I like smart ass answers. Years. <laughs> 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 but I don't know how much exposure they have, but it doesn't, it doesn't deplete. I don't know how it doesn't do that, but it doesn't deeply. You know, mercury's a liquid at room temperature. It gets amalgamated in there. It off gases all the time. It's still off gas. Smoke and tooth video. It doesn't disappear. Yeah, which didn't didn't play. Did we play that? Uh, that's not in your presentation anymore. Well, it's supposed to be. And I don't know if it didn't play or what. Well, it's all over YouTube. Anyway, the smoke and tooth video. I think it didn't play. Well, I got it on my computer too. It's supposed to be in there, but I think it just didn't play. I think it had two back to back and it didn't play. Yeah, trying to bring it up back here. Yeah. Let's try and find it. <laughs> I have a question about um, the actual procedure. When you're doing full mouth or a quadrant or whatever you're doing, do you remove the amalgam and then take all the barriers off, kind of reset the room, and then do your rest restorative? Why not just change rooms? Can, you can do that too. And are you doing that because of comfort? It's yeah, more comfortable to restore without the mask and all that? Off, right? Yeah. You'll get, you'll get really efficient at this. Really good at it. Hopefully. I'm often asked by patients about amalgam underneath crowns. Endo-treated or non-endo-treated. If it's endo-treated, um, there's no pulp supply, there's no blood supply, so there's no vapors being absorbed. What do I, t what's the best way to approach that? Do you mean that there's no mercury going through the tooth anymore? I don't, I, 
that's not true, I don't think. I think there's still retrograde exposure, right, Dave? Isn't there still? Did y'all hear that? Say it again. Uh, Till did autopsies of people that had amalgam fillings and found more mercury at the apex of the tooth than in, in the uh, uh, tooth itself. So even even root canal ones. So Griffith, that's yeah. I don't know if we're going to hear it, but oh, you got it. That should be of concern to anyone. So all mercury silver fillings leak substantial amounts of mercury constantly. <coughs> The amount increases with any kind of stimulation, and as a result, mercury from fillings produces the majority of human exposure to mercury. The International Academy of Oral Medicine and Toxicology is extremely concerned about the anecdotal claims of safety by manufacturers and dental trade associations. There are variants with the published, peer-reviewed scientific evidence to the contrary. The precautionary principle requires action once the possibility of harm exists. It does not require proof beyond a shadow of a doubt that in the case of heavy metal and xenobiotic exposure is both nearly impossible and unnecessary in our opinion. What you're seeing is mercury vapor coming off a 25-year-old silver amalgam filling in an extracted tooth. The background is a phosphorescent screen. The mercury vapor absorbs the fluorescent light and you can see it as a shadow on the screen. This is mercury coming off a filling that was dipped in water that's the same temperature as the human body. This is a filling that was rubbed with a pencil eraser for just a few seconds. Like going to the hygienist and having her clean your teeth. These are not small amounts of mercury. If you can see it, it's more than 1,000 times higher than the Environmental Protection Agency will allow for the air that we breathe. What about the last time you went to the dentist and they drilled on your tooth? Here is the mercury vapor every time you raise the temperature to 110 degrees with hot coffee or warm water or even chewed on it. Mercury comes off fillings every time you stimulate them and that simulation causes the mercury to continue to leak out of the fillings for an hour and a half at a minimum. Some people grind their teeth. Some people chew gum. The dentist might send an old gold crown to the dental lab to be welded. How about the dental personnel? They're not being given informed consent. Back in 1985, the International Academy of Oral Medicine Toxicology set out to determine the amount of mercury that was coming off fillings. And here's the graph. Showing substantial quantities of mercury were measured coming off fillings. And then we estimated the total dose. And then we began animal experiments and put radioactive fillings in sheep. Mercury accumulated in the jaw, stomach, liver, and kidney of the sheep in just 30 days. Substantial quantities of mercury spread from the fillings to every organ in that sheep's body. Then we measured that the sheep's kidneys dropped in their ability by 60% to clear inulin, an indication of kidney malfunction. Whole body imaging of monkeys found exactly the same thing. Proponents of amalgam fillings claim that sheep chew too much. Well, what's the problem with monkeys? They had mercury in their jaw, kidneys, liver, intestine, and heart. And further research found dystrophic bacteria that were antibiotic resistant cropped up in the intestines within two weeks of receiving these mercury leaking fillings. Further studies have found damage to the ADP ribosylation of brain neuron proteins. In response to the controversy, and at the request of the Federation of Experimental Scientists and Biologists, Drs. Fritz Scheider and Murray Vimy wrote an editorial, the first ever in FACET, that point by point refuted the claims of the amalgam proponents. That should be of concern to anyone wanting to have healthy children because mercury is highly damaging to fetuses. Experiments in sheep showed that mercury from the sheep's fillings transferred immediately to the placenta, to the unborn fetus, and to every conceivable portion of the fetus's body. It even increased in the lamb higher after birth from mercury in the mother's milk. 
There's no such thing as a safe mercury filling. All mercury fillings leak mercury. The combined effect of mercury, cadmium, and lead is just now being investigated, but it's not one in one. It's synergistic, and one in one may make 100 or even 1,000. Why is that of concern? Over and over again, we've heard that children are exposed to lead from our environment. Mercury and lead is many times more toxic than just mercury alone. These black, corroded, pitted mercury fillings are used where you must drill away a third of the tooth in order to fix a pinhead sized cavity. Even if you love mercury, it's the wrong thing to do to the children. It leads to broken, diseased, root canal, extracted teeth throughout the rest of the life. It's a blunder that costs the child all through their life. Millions and millions of dollars are spent annually fixing teeth again and again. And dentists don't follow the manufacturer's recommendations. They pack mercury in children around gold crowns, underneath bridges. They stuff it around the gum line in contact with tissues. There's mercury spreading from this gold crown to every tissue in that patient's body. Even if you like mercury fillings, putting that kind of filling in the tooth is simply the wrong thing to do. Harold Lowe, the former director of the National Institute of Dental Research back in 1993, wrote, the first filling is a critical step in the life of the tooth. Using amalgam for the first filling requires removing a lot of tooth substance, not only diseased tooth substance, but healthy tooth substance as well. So in making the undercuts, you sacrifice a lot, and this results in a weakened tooth. The next thing you know, the tooth breaks off, and you need a crown. Then you need to repair the crown. And so it continues to the stage where there's no more to repair, and you pull the tooth. With the first filling, you should do something that can either restore the tooth or retain more healthy tooth substance. Use new materials, composites, or materials that can bond to the surface without undercuts. You can do this with little removal of the tooth substance so that the core of the tooth is still there. I would add that the cost of all that dental repair over and over again makes the cost of mercury fillings enormous even if you don't consider the neurological impairment and the brain damage that they surely cause in dental personnel and the infertility and the heartbreak that they've caused to so many families. It is the opinion of this academy that responsible government agencies should prohibit the use of these fillings until such time as their manufacturers produce the alleged evidence of safety. These instructions can be found on the webpage of the International Academy of Oral Medicine and Toxicology. I would recommend. Interesting story. Hey, that, that was bonus stuff. Are you going to show you all that? That's a great summary of what we talked That's about really today. Good. I'll tell you one, quickly tell you one, another little story. Very good friend of mine, the dentist. Um, we did all, we did some practice management groups together. We all, this group of dentists actually, all went through LVI together and did all that kind of stuff way back when. And I, would, I was the first one to get mercury poisoning. I told other guys about it. You know, like most dentists, they said, yeah, not me. I'm Superman. Well, there's a very good friend of mine. He's got two of his new assistants here today. Um, all of a sudden, went into acute renal failure. Out of the blue. He almost died while he was in the hospital. Luckily, they got his kidneys functioning again, and he's, he's okay now. But I finally got through to the dummy, go get your mercury levels checked. And guess what? They were high. Now, he's kind of in a little predicament because you'd have to really be careful going through chelation for him and go through those kidneys. It's not what he should be doing. So hopefully we'll get Boyd stuff out and we'll get him on that and continue to improve. They about lost him, and I'm sure it was, I'm sure it was Mercury. Now, he's a member of IMT. He's sending his employees. He's hopefully doing the stuff. I'll find out today. So I'm going to eat lunch with him. So, man, it's too important not to not do this. Too, especially all these young faces out there, all these females out there who are going to have children. you got to do this. If there's any, any consolation or proof of what we're talking about. Um, so 
from day one in my practice, I always had a rubber dam, always had an oxygen source, always had the denner vac. 1993, it came out like the year before that. So I had dinner. So I did everything that you see on the protocol except I didn't have like, you know, my plastic mask. I didn't have them fully covered, hair and eyes, but I did all that, right? And five or six years ago, Chris Shade, who's a, who's a chemist in the academy, uh, tested 100 of us, where 100 of us did the, his tri test, which tests for inorganic mercury, organic mercury, methyl mercury, to see what the levels were. So we all, all 100 of us did it. It was hair, urine, and blood. And yours truly had the lowest inorganic mercury. And I think it's because I've always had a pretty darn good protective protocol. I mean, and yet we've added a few things, but a lot of us dentists didn't do that. They came here because they were practicing mainstream, got sick, and now they want to practice like that. So it does, you have to protect yourself. We still got time. We got about 10 minutes for questions. Dave Kennedy. Tell you, <clears throat> tell you a brief anecdotal story, but uh, that we've got case control studies showing that putting amalgams in <clears throat> causes uh, damage to the proximal tubule in children. So when people say, oh, it's been proven safe, no, it's been proven harmful, and that's the Casapia study, that you've got all the, oh, it's safe, it's safe, it's safe, and then in 2011, uh, Woods pointed out that uh, it damaged the boys that were CPOX4 in all five domains. You know how many domains you got? Five of them. So, and then Geyer showed that in a dose-dependent fashion that the proximal tubule uh, began to fail and produce a GSST, um, reduced glutathione, indicating damage to the proximal tubule. We've had people come off kidney dialysis on Boyd Haley's compound. I'll translate that in English. <laughs> there was a thing called the Children's Amalgam Trials where they actually put amalgam fillings in children. Uh, one was in an orphanage and one was on the east coast, I think, of the United States, New England, which is a horrible thing to do anyway. These were not true consent forms. But they compared it to composite fillings and said, look, we tested it and yes, there was definitely an increase in urinary mercury concentration, but after five years it was even, it was all even. And they completely left out the whole point that, well, it's stuck in the body, idiot. You have to chelate it out. There's a reason why. Plus, like he mentioned, some people can methylate. Others can't. They, they never even looked at that. So Woods, who was the main author, had to kind of retract and realize that, wow, to his credit, we really didn't look at all that. So that made the cover of JAMA. It was, it was literally, you know, amalgam fillings are perfectly safe. Here's the proof. And it's and it, and it just not true. So other questions? None? Oh, two. I can hand you first. I do have a question. When you guys do the removal, you guys um, have the patient doing like an after protocol. What do you guys recommend afterward? Well, that's a good question. Is it like, a, yeah. Well, that's a, so that's a good question. Gesticulation. Yeah. I mean, if they need it, they need to be tested. But so if they could, you, I mean, you can do the Quicksilver product, Merck, Merck Protect. It does help clean them up. But that's as far as I go. Chlorella's fine. A lot so of them will be taking that. We all do it differently. Honestly, there's no protocol that the, this academy is going to tell you. Like you mentioned chlorella. That's a mobilizer. That's not a chelator. Neither is cilantro. Those move stuff around, but don't necessarily chelate it out. So just we, are, we, we all do it differently. Everybody does it differently. I offer yeah. IV versus oral supplementation, I tell them IV's better. If you want to do it, here's what's involved. Otherwise, here's some really good products that we have, whether it's Quicksilver or Boyd Haley stuff that's coming out or whatever. So it, everybody's it's different. vitamin C IV. Some of them are using clays, uh, I mean, you charcoal. Can't. There's no such thing. You wise, but we've been, we're doing, well, I'm doing more vitamin C's with my surgical patients, but we're doing a lot of IV. But I got, I have a, Again, I have a functional medicine doctor that does that for me. They go by her place, grab it, come to the office, and go the next day. Mainly because I don't have room. Good morning. Uh, <laughs> uh, how do you deal with um, the whole, you know, if they, if they have big amalgams uh, with the post-operative sensitivity or how to minimize that situation? Well, I actually, I use ozone. Um, on all my, all our restorations, ozone's oxygen with an extra molecules of gas, 
uh, it helps decontaminate the tooth, kill the bacteria that's under those fillings. Um, but I mean, there's <coughs> I don't use liners or anything like that. I just use I just use ozone. Not you know, it's still an issue sometimes, but it usually goes away. My name is Oksana Savyak. I'm retired from dentistry, and I do wellness consulting as a doctor of natural medicine. And there is still a m misconception out there that, oh, dentists don't use that mercury stuff anymore, do they? And when I point out that every institution in Canada, at least, that pays, that the government pays for, for instance, the Army, public health, institutions, uh, nursing homes, etc., they still have mercury amalgams mandated. The other thing is, many people don't know that they have amalgams. When you point it out, they are furious. How could my dentist do this to me? So, when they get sick, they start blaming the dentist. One last question, maybe? Anybody have a good one that hasn't asked a question yet? Uh, back there. Oh, you have an answer question? Okay. Well, there's time for that, too. The reason Joe doesn't have a lot of trouble with sens post-op sensitivity is he disinfects the tooth. And that's what we were never taught. And that uh, Mayore in 1973 showed that post-op sensitivity of uh, composite is due to bacterial activity underneath the filling. So when the thing is all cleaned out, stop and clean it out, disinfect it. And that's what the ozone's for and there's other things. But bacteria under the filling is what causes the mercury. Okay, good point. Okay, one last question. All right, it's you. So I'm just interested, I know you guys have been doing this for a long time, but I'm just imagining myself going back and telling patients, I'm, I've been holistic for a long time and kind of in, you know, to holistic health, but um, I can, I'm just trying to imagine telling some, somebody, hey, it's 190 bucks out of pocket that you've got to pay to, to do this and we're going to put all this stuff on you and on me. That's just, I mean, that's, that's a problem dentists have, and really it's a problem you got to correct because it's between your ears. It's not between theirs. Are you talking about paying for your extra stuff? And you don't have to, hey, you okay. don't have to do it that way. You can just increase your fees to take care of if you want to. You don't have to make it a big deal. But then the patients who don't need it, you know, you're going to have two different restorative fees. It gets kind of complicated. Wait, I can, I can. So, no, but you can do it either way. What you see me wearing in that video? You can't give it away. Joe, hang okay. on a second. You can't give it away. <laughs> I'm going to answer your question directly. $5.96 is what that costs <clears throat> for me to wear that. Five, six bucks. So, what I don't six the, bucks? He's got that $6 is what it costs for the robe, for the plastic shield, for the use of the mask that you can wear for like, you know, three months. I'm telling you, I've done the math on this. It's $6. Right. Well, I'm so mine's a little higher. It's about twenty-six dollars. Whatever. You don't have to charge one hundred and ninety dollars. Is what I'm saying. If if you want to just raise your fees a little bit, or just say, fine, it's a fifty dollar or whatever protection fee. Yeah. Set it where you want it. Don't make it that. I just that raised big of a deal. my fees, and it was never a question. That's I it. have never had I don't anybody, charge for it. anybody ever ask me about it. No. Nope. Even okay. even when you put the mask on, I mean, I've, over the years, I might have had two people go, "Why are you wearing that mask?" I said, "It's about your breath." And, then, <laughs> and just laugh, you know. But no, it's just not an, it's not an issue. We actually do have time for one more. And, and you need perio treatment. That's why I got the mask on. <laughs> do you know, does anyone participate with insurance and make this kind of treatment model work? I don't. No. no. You could. Insurance. Again, remember, you're a dentist, right? You're doing dentistry. What do you charge to replace an amalgam filling with a new composite? It's dentistry. So don't make it not dentistry. Don't don't make it about toxicity or whatever. Make it about doing dentistry. And, and make sure you've got photographs to back up the fracture lines and the cracks and stuff like That's that. That's right. If you send that in with the insurance company, the co their complaint when they send it back and when the, you know this didn't need to be done. Well, yeah, here's the cracks and you can see it. I draw little lines to show it to them. But yeah, that, that I've never had that denied. We just recently got out of our insurance plans, and when people do have insurance, we just explain to them that these are things that your insurance will cover.
going over a treatment plan, and these are things that your insurance will not cover. So the mercury removal fee is not an insurance benefit that is covered, or this, it is not a benefit, and this is what will be at each appointment, what, you're, what you'll be expected out of pocket, and these are things that insurance will cover, and no one has ever had a problem with it. Like I said, I've been fee for service for over 20 years. I don't deal with insurance. We'll file it for them. When they bring up insurance, they say, how much is your insurance going to pay? I say, I have no idea what it's going to pay. This is what it's going to cost. They'll make financial arrangements with you up front. But I, I really don't know what things cost in my office, exactly. You know, I can give a guess. My, my team handles that. I don't get involved in it. You know, they they want to know, what's, how much is a crown? I go, I don't know. don't know what kind, but the EMAX is 16-something. So it's probably 1627. I don't know what it is, but they take care of it. But they'll take care of all that for you, and that just kind of goes away. We do have financial arrangements, they get care credit and some other stuff, whatever. But if they can't pay for it, then they can go somewhere else. Now, I'm not that cruel. I do a lot of free dentistry on patients these days. We do about once a quarter. I have a whole day. I just do free dentistry. I try to do it with veterans, but they just give it away. So. Okay, lunch is outside next door. Be back at 1 o'clock, okay? Enjoy your lunch. <laughs>